Tonight, we start with a party of hate. The Republican Party in this country has been running on hate and division for the last 50 years. First, it was a Southern strategy meant to discriminate against African Americans in order to gain white Southern votes. That worked in capturing the South for a generation or more. But they lost the entire African American vote for even longer. That's what happens when you slap someone across the face. Then, once that well started to run dry, they apologized. In 2005, Republican Chairman Ken Melman told the NAACP he was sorry. Quote, some Republicans gave up on winning the African American vote, looking the other way, or trying to benefit politically from racial polarization. I'm here today as a Republican chairman to tell you we were wrong. And then they unapologetically picked their next target, gay Americans. They ran campaigns all across America, pre premised on taking away rights from gays in this country. Please, sir, let's continue our questions. Let's get right down to the floor. And John DeSpace of the union leader. Thank you, John. Uh, Congresswoman Bachman, let's turn to a serious subject. Uh, New Hampshire is one of five states uh, where individuals who happen to be gay can marry legally. Uh, this is a question of conflicting interests. I know you're opposed to same-sex marriage. As president, would you try to overturn, what influence would you use from the White House to try to overturn these state laws, despite your own personal belief that states should handle their own affairs whenever possible and in many circumstances? Well, I do believe in the Tenth Amendment, and I do believe in self-determination for the states. I also believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. I carried that legislation when I was a senator in Minnesota, and I believe that in, for, the, for children, the best possible way to raise children is to have a mother and father in their life. Now, I didn't come from a perfect background. My parents were divorced and I was raised by a single mother. There's a lot of single families and families with troubled situations. That's why my husband and I have broken hearts for at-risk kids. And it's why we took 23 foster children into our home. Uh, to initiate and facilitate a repeal law on the state level. Anything at all from the White House? Would you come into the state of New Hampshire, for instance, and, and campaign on behalf of a repeal law? I'm running for the presidency of the United States, and I don't see that it's the role of a president to go into states and interfere with their state law. All right. Well, let's, let's, uh, on, that, on, on that point... Let me ask you a question about another issue that came up last night, gay marriage. At first you suggested that you don't think that state laws that legalize gay marriage should be, should be overturned. And there are states, both Iowa and New Hampshire, have legalized. No, George, George. No, George. The question that I was asked was, if I was president of the United States, would I come into the states that have passed that legislation and, and advocate either for or against a state law. And as President of the United States, that would not but, be my role you later, to advocate but, but, for but, or against a right, state law. Right, you but la you later said that you were for a constitutional amendment, and the constitutional amendment to ban gay marriage would have the effect of overturning state law. Well, in my home state, I was the chief author of a constitutional amendment to define marriage as between a man and a woman. That's consistently been my position. And I do support that position at a federal level. And I do support that position at a federal level. On that point, to, to voters out there for whom this is an important issue, let's, let's try to quickly go through it. Let, let me start at this end. We'll just go right through. I'll, I'll describe it this way. Are you a George W. Bush Republican, meaning a constitutional amendment to ban same-sex marriage, or this decision, same-sex marriage, should be a state's decision? State's decision. John, I support a constitutional amendment to define marriage as between a man and a woman. I was the co-author of okay. the state uh, law in Minnesota to define okay. it, but okay. now we have courts jumping over Okay, let's over just go that. through. The, the federal government should be involved. I wouldn't support an amendment, but let me suggest one of the ways to solve this ongoing debate about marriage, look up the dictionary, we know what marriage is all about, but then get the government out of it. Why doesn't it go to the church and why doesn't it go to the individuals? I think, I right. think government okay. should give us a okay. license to get okay. married. It should be in the church. Co Governor Romney, constitutional amendment or a state decision? Constitutional. Mr. Speaker? Well, I helped author the Defense of Marriage Act, which the Obama administration should be, right. frankly, protecting in court. 
I think if that fails, at that point, you have no choice except to go to a constitutional amendment. We heard the congresswoman's answer, Senator. Constitutional amendment. Look, the constitutional amendment includes the states. Three quarters of the states have to have to ratify it. So the states will be involved in this process. We should have one law in the country with respect to marriage. There needs to be consistency on something as foundational as what marriage. Very quickly, John, I do support a constitutional amendment on, on uh, marriage between a man and a woman, but I would not be going into the states to overturn their state law. In my home state, I was the chief author of a constitutional amendment to define marriage as between a man and a woman. That's consistently been my position, and I do support that position at a federal level. Uh, right, let, let me ask you another question. The Obama the Obama administration is in the process, and Leon Panetta, the new defense secretary, will implement the, the, essentially the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So gays will be allowed to serve openly in the military. I want to ask each of you, and again, if we can be quickly, because then we want to get to the voters' questions. If you, were pres if you become president of the United States, now gays are allowed to serve openly in the military, would you leave that policy in place, or would you try to change it? Go back to Don't Ask, Don't Tell, or something else? If I had my druthers, I never would have overturned Don't Ask, Don't Tell in the first place. Now that they have changed it, I wouldn't create a distraction trying to turn it over as president. Okay. Our men and women have too many other things okay. to be concerned about rather than have to deal with that as a distraction. Leave it in place if you inherit the new Obama administration policy or try to overturn it. John, we're a nation of two wars. I think we need to pay deference to our military commanders, particularly our combatant commanders. And in this case, I would take my cues from them as to how this affects the military going forward. I know they expressed concerns, many of the combatant commanders did, when this was originally repealed by the Obama Con administration. I, I would not work to overthrow it, but we have to remember, rights don't come in groups. We shouldn't have gay rights. Rights come as individuals, and we wouldn't have this major debate going on. It would be behavior that would count, not the person who belongs to which group. Leave it in place. What you inherit from the Obama administration or overturn it? Well, one, we ought to be talking about the economy and jobs. But given the fact you're insistent, the, uh, the answer is I believe that Don't Ask, Don't Tell should have been kept in place until conflict was over. Mr. Speaker? Well, I think it's very powerful that both the Army and the Marines overwhelmingly opposed changing it that their recommendation was against changing it. And if, as president, I've met with them and they said, you know, it isn't working, it is dangerous, it's disrupting unit morale, and we should go back, I would listen to the commanders whose lives are at risk about the young men and women that they are, in fact, trying to protect. And the Republicans, well, they always preach about listening to the generals. Well, the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff says gays should be able to serve openly in the military. But today, just another big shocker. Senate Republicans bucked military leaders and voted to obstruct. Another filibuster. And... Congresswoman? I would, I would keep the don't ask, don't tell policy. So you would, whatever the Obama administration does now, you would go try to go back? You try to reverse I, I, what they're doing. I would, after right. again, okay. uh, following right. much what the speaker just right. said, I would want to confer with our commanders in chief and with also with the Joint Chiefs of Staff because I'd want to know how it was being implemented and if it has had had the detrimental effects that have been suggested that will right. come. Last word on this issue, Senator. The job of the United States military is to protect and defend the people of this country. It is not for social experimentation. It should be repealed, and the commanders should have a system of discipline in place, as Ron Paul said. Right that, punishes, punish, that punishes bad behavior. Republicans are looking for a real challenger to Mitt Romney since many conservatives think he's too moderate and some consider him to be a slippery serial flip-flopper. A fair charge. But right now the GOP field is filled with leftovers. There doesn't seem to be a national figure that inspires the base. But here comes Rick Perry, the governor of Texas, riding in on a social conservative base. It looks like he's getting ready to jump into that fight. Perry spending a lot of time this week crisscrossing the country, making headlines on the national stage. He flew here to Los Angeles on Sunday, speaking at a religious rally and attacking President Obama on abortion. With the stroke of a pen, abortion essentially became a U.S. foreign export. I'm deeply disturbed at the prospect of experimentation that uses such tissue turning the remains of unborn children into nothing more than raw material. Well, that's going to play well with the bikes. And tomorrow night, he heads to New York, where he's replacing Donald Trump as the top speaker at the big GOP dinner there. And Saturday, he's the star of the Republican Leadership Conference in New Orleans. Some Republicans think Perry could be just what they need. He's a Southern governor with solid popularity in his state and great credentials with the religious right. Of course, he's also led his state 
into a $27 billion budget deficit. He's talking about seceding from the union, and perhaps worst of all, he's a former Democrat. Back in 1988, he was Al Gore's campaign manager for Texas. Oops. But that was many moons ago before Perry decided it was better politics to move a billion miles to the political right. I think this guy could be the one that really gives Romney a ride for his money, though. So let's officially start the national conversation about Rick Perry. There's certain aspects about Texas tax structure, regulation. We don't pay very much to, uh, for social programs. You're at the bottom on health care. We have more uninsured children than any other state. Those are elements that make the budget work, but also create, it's a right-to-work state, that create a job, a business-friendly environment. At the same time, Rick Perry is now presiding over a legislative session uh, that will balance the budget by cuts alone, $15 billion in cuts from the current budget, uh, a few smoke and mirrors, and basically going into the next biennium the way they have it now by not paying off some bills, leaving the next legislature with billions of dollars in bills. So it's, a, it's an economic record that certainly would be uh, applauded by Josh's group and other fiscal conservatives but it's not one that always uh, everybody in the state, especially if you're poor and disadvantaged, thinks is all that great. Well, you know, let, let's talk about God's plan, because what these uh, conservatives, Michelle Bachman, said, they all seem to know what God's up to. Rick Perry is similar, but it's an interesting quote here. Let's show you that. I think we're going through those difficult economic times for a purpose and that uh, uh, to, to, to bring us back to those biblical principles of, uh, you know, you don't spend all the money, not asking for Pharaoh to, to, to give everything to everybody and to take care of, of, of folks because at the end of the day, uh, it's slavery. Wayne, that seems like a curious argument that we are going through this economic times because of biblical reasons. Was, did God want us to go through the economic times? Does that, I mean, I don't know, does that sell in Texas and does it sell across the country? A provocative new book titled On My Honor, Why the American Values of the Boy Scouts Are Worth Fighting For, takes on the moral struggle being waged by the ACLU against traditional groups like the Boy Scouts, a, ba a battle the book describes as the new front in the culture war. The author of On My Honor, Texas Governor Rick Perry, joins us now. Good evening, Governor. Thank you for coming on. Hello, Susan. I have a, you know, I'm a former ACLU type, so what can I tell you? I don't think the ACLU <laughs> has anything against the Boy Scouts per se. It's the exclusion, or dare I say, discrimination against gays. Why is that American? The, the real issue here is why does the ACLU continue to fight the Boy Scouts, try to push them out of public facilities like in Philadelphia, which is absolutely a, an atrocity in my opinion. Well, if there was a private group that excluded, say, white men or black men. Should they use public facilities? I mean, why do we have public facilities for a group that openly discriminates against Americans on the basis of sexual orientation? That, is, that issue's gone all the way to the Supreme Court, and they ruled in favor of the Scouts. Scouts have been there for almost 100 years. Uh, they've been teaching young men to be uh, very courageous men of character, the next leaders. Uh, when you look across the military, the business world, the leaders in this country, uh, before a lot of them wore the uniforms that they wear today, they wore the scout uniform before. Everyone, even my liberal friends <laughs> across the board, uh, are pretty much supporters of all of those traditional values of trustworthiness and kindness and courtesy and uh, friendliness. I mean, which well, one of those exclude, does the ACLU uh, have a problem they with? They have a problem with only one, the exclusion of gays from being able to, from a gay, for, of a gay kid or a gay scoutmaster from being able to be part of that. Why is that But that's acceptable? already gone to the Supreme I, yeah, Court, but Susan. So I mean, the issue's been and, and settled. They were wrong. Uh, I mean, the and, fact that the Supreme well, Court decided doesn't mean they're right. <laughs> Well, the bottom line is I think that Scouts needs to be about teaching those traditional values. It doesn't need to be about teaching sexuality. Is Sarah Palin moderating her views on gay rights? And if so, why? The question stems from a Palin retweet of a gay activist message about repealing the military's don't ask, don't tell policy. That activist, Tammy Bruce of GOP Proud, tweeted this about critics of the repeal. This hypocrisy is just too much. Enough already. 
Palin then retweeted that message to all of her followers on Twitter, which made Tammy Bruce very, very happy. She issued a follow-up tweet suggesting it was Governor Palin's first comment in the Don't Ask, Don't Tell debate and what Bruce called, quote, attempts to marginalize us. In fact, it isn't, is not Palin's first comment on the issue. Eleven months ago, she said this on Fox News Sunday. Should the rule, don't ask, don't tell for the military, be repealed? I don't think so right now. And I say that because um, there are other things to be worried about right now with the military. I, I think that kind of on the back burner is sufficient for now. To, to put so much time and effort and politics into it, unnecessary. So why what appears to be a change of heart and a change of policy? Roland Martin, Cornell Belcher, Rich Galen are still with us. That was a non -den that was, we used to call that a non-denial denial. What did she just say? I'm trying to figure out what that, what that 